First Corinthians chapter 6, remember we're moving through, as we move through First Corinthians, Paul corrects the church on a, on a few things. He starts off in chapter 1, encouraging the church, blessing the church, telling them that yes, though they have a lot of issues and sin issues going on in the church and the leadership wasn't dealing with it properly, they were actually glorying in it. He still treated them with love. He treated them with respect. He treated them like a father would treat a son that's wayward. But then as you get into chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, he goes one by one. He starts to, I don't want to say pick the church apart, but he starts to correct them. He starts to correct them because he desired, the scriptures tell us, as you get to the end of this, to present them a chaste virgin to Christ. The imagery there is, I want you to be a pure church. I want you to be pure, separate, holy, sanctified, set apart for the master's use. Anybody who's in spiritual leadership in any way, and we all are in one way or another, whether it's over our kids or whoever else, that's what we should want for them. Them to be closer to Jesus than we can be. Them to be nearer to the heart of God than even we are. That's what we should want, and that's what Paul wants. You remember the heart of Paul? Remember in Romans 9, Paul's heart was so on fire for Christ, and it was so brokenhearted for God's people, the Jews. Paul said, I would be a curse from Christ. Basically, Paul said, I would go to hell forever if the Jews could be saved. Can you imagine that? That's the kind of heart we need to have for one another. That's a difficult. That's difficult. We can only have that kind of heart when we get along with the Savior. When we spend time with the Savior. And as he corrects the church, yes, he's, he's hard on them sometimes, but he's only doing it out of love. He's doing because he he's doing because he wants what's best for them. Now, in the last chapter, chapter five, he corrected them on sexual sin, and the sexual sin sin that he corrects, he says, isn't even done among the Gentiles, meaning that unbelievers don't even practice this. Basically, a man was sleeping with his mother-in-law. And the church just said, Oh, we're under grace. We could do whatever we want. We're forgiven. No one corrected it. No one did anything about it. And Paul said, you guys aren't brokenhearted over this. You haven't mourned over this. You haven't, you know, sought the Lord's heart. You haven't corrected this. You can't do this. And then he gets into it with him, into it with him and he says, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? He says, don't you know if you start to let this go, it's going to run rampant throughout the church? You know what? And God's work will be hindered. And he, cor he corrects them out of love. And he tells them, you need to put this brother out. Paul says, I'm not with you right now, but I've already judged in spirit, meaning that I know what's going on there. And I know that this isn't just hearsay. I know it's the truth. And you guys need to do something about this. You need to, you need to correct this individual. You need to put them out. Because sometimes when you put people out, and you just, you know, and you stop letting them do what they're doing, finally, they're, you know, they stop having one foot in the church and one foot out because their, their lifestyle and their heart wants to be out because if you don't put them out, they infect everyone else and what's going on in the church and a little leaven leavens the whole lump and the work of God can't go forward. So sometimes when you put them out, Paul puts it in this way, deliver them to Satan. So the imagery here is what? That when we come together, we're in communion, we're with God, with the Holy Spirit, we're one, we're like, it's a little, it should be a little piece of heaven going on. Now I know when we come into church, it's, sometimes it's the furthest thing from that. Things going on in our minds and our hearts, I have this against this person, this against that person, this is going on in my, oh, I can't stand, I don't even want to be here, I'm just giving you my time, hurry up, pass the mat, everything else, all that's going on. But the fact of the matter says, you know, if you read the book of Hebrews, the scriptures say when we gather together, we gather as one, and we don't just gather just a bunch of people staring at each other and just singing to the ear. The Bible says we gather before the throne of God. With the holy angels and with the saints that have gone before. Read the book of Hebrews. And Paul says, correct this person. You need to put them out. Now he's going to move on in chapter 6. And he's going to get into a few more details. And I'm thankful for the book of Corinthians because we kind of learn what not to do as a church. 
So now listen to me. So this means, listen, if you're students of the word, and it's not only the pastor's job, the pastor's job and the leader's job to be students of the word, we all should be. You should take what I say and then go home or think about it, dwell on it throughout the week and say, you know what? Is this really what the Bible says? I hope you do that. You should do that. You should take what the word says, take what you hear from me, go home and dissect it and weigh it to what the Bible says. Not just to what you think or what you think you know. Read your Bible yourself. Take it home and digest it. Think about it and say, Lord, you know what? I want, if this is the truth, and I believe it is because I just read it too, and that's why we, we, we teach the scriptures line upon line here. So you can't say that Pastor Matt's just conjuring up things on Sunday mornings. I'm not smart enough to do that, by the way. When I first started ministry, listen, when I first started ministry and learned how to preach, they used to teach us, you know, go home and prepare a sermon. And I was like, well, how do I do that? They were like, well, you need an intro, you need a body, you need a conclusion. You ever hear that? That's kind of the way you're supposed to write, too. Intro, body, conclusion, all right? Then you got points and subpoints. so I'd be like this. I'd go home, I'd take my Bible, and I'd be like, where do I get a point from? I'm, like, I'm flipping over here, I'm flipping over there. I'm like, okay, well, you know, and I'm trying to match things up, and I'm like, and then I just started reading the Bible. Then I just started listening to sermons. And if you just read the text, it already has an intro, a body, and a conclusion. All right? Now, if we read the Apostle Paul's writing, the intro is usually, you know, two chapters long, you know? And then the body, and then, and, and then the conclusion sometimes is this big, and in some of the other epistles, it's this big. But the Bible kind of does that for you. And, and, and what Paul does here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is he starts to correct them on some other matters. He corrected sexual sin. He corrected hero worship in the church, basically putting one leader above another leader, saying, you know what, let's follow Christ together. Yes, you should have good leaders above you that you know they want to worship the Lord, but stop pitting them one against another. And stop causing division and factions in the church, he tells them. He corrects this sexual sin in now chapter 6. It says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? He goes, let me just say something to you. He goes, this is strong language. Dare any of you? Basically, how dare you, he says. How dare you? Take the matters that are going on in the church and take it to unjust courts. Now, now the reason why he says unjust, what he means by this is unsaved people. People that don't know Christ. What was going on in the church? Now listen, Corinth was known for, yes, they were known for public debates. They would stand up in the arenas and they would debate one another. And the person who sounded better, who looked better, who could sway the crowd, there was like a little worship of that person. But they were also known for, you know, court debates. Sometimes they had over 100 people sitting on a jury. How do you make a decision with 100 people sitting on a jury? I mean, seriously. But that went on in the city of Corinth all the time. It was a big production to sue people and just have the public arena sit and listen to the court case. Remember the OJ trials? Remember, when, remember 20 years ago what was going on with that? And everybody's locked on and you know who's got the better lawyers and the better arguments against the DA and all this stuff? Craziness. We, you know, we kind of live in the same kind of thought process, by the way. It's like a big show. And that's what they were doing. Instead of just taking even the smallest matters, going to people in the church that are even a little bit spiritual and saying, hey, can you help me sort this out? They, didn't, they disregarded all that, and they went right to the public arena. And they aired out all of each, everybody in the church's <laughs> dirty laundry in public. You know, the world loves that, by the way. You know that, right? The world loves that. They, they look for it, actually. They look for it. Oh, you know, those crazy Christians again. Oh, look what this pastor so-and-so did. Look what this person did. Look, look what that church did. Look what that movement did. They love that stuff. Instead of doing it the way it's supposed to be done, in-house. The church is supposed to be able to correct one another in the church. 
God sets up these things for a reason so it doesn't have to go out there before the unjust, before the unsaved. Because the first thing they're going to do is they're going to say, hey, didn't your Jesus say you're supposed to love one another? You're taking this, this person to court over a couple thousand dollars? What a joke. Isn't it sad? Because that's what happens all the time. If you read through, the Bible says, why not suffer yourself to be defrauded? You know what that means? When it comes to money, listen, we've been taken advantage of here as a church before, in the past, a couple times. We had contractors do the build-out on our, on our old building, Christian contractor, this and that, in the, in the place on Bourbon Street. And um, I paid him as the GC. He was supposed to pay all the other contractors, and he ended up not paying the HVAC contractor his last payment of $9,000. So I'll say, okay. So I'd go to them. Like the Bible says, go to them. Don't just email them. Right? Don't just text them. Don't just post something on Facebook to try to get back at them. The Bible says, go to them. So I went to him in love and I said, hey, you know, we, we gave you that money. You're the GC. You need to pay this contractor. Now, the contractor, again, not a Christian man, the, the HVAC guy, the GC was, the general contractor, he comes to me a couple weeks later, and he says, hey, I didn't get paid. I said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, I paid him. And he says, well, he said you didn't pay him. I said, listen, we have records in the church. I'll show you that we paid him. And, he, and the guy goes, again, he's a contractor. He says, I don't care what that says. I want my $9,000. So to have good rapport with the, with the contractor, Good rapport with the town because he would went and blurted out everywhere, that church didn't pay me. We paid him another $9,000. Never got that $9,000 back. We suffered ourselves to be defrauded, taken advantage of. Because in, in, in all, who's in control? $9,000 to God's nothing, right? Now that other gentleman, he's going to have to deal with the Lord on his own. Now listen, that's believers with believers. Now listen, if it's an unbeliever trying to take advantage of the church, I'll go, I'll go to the nth with them to, 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 <laughs> to stick up for what God has given the church. But if it's a believer, the Bible says, suffer yourself to be defrauded. Why drag the church through the mud? Why do that? And it's sad, as I was studying through this, as I'm reading through this, because you think about what about the times when the you know when a family's involved or, or or a woman or a child and this and that and people in the church just won't submit to what the church is saying or to what godly counsel is saying. What are you supposed to do? Well, first of all, that person should be disfellowshipped from the church if they won't listen to godly counsel over and over and over again. That's what Paul says. That's what the Bible says. And then sometimes people are forced to go out there to unjust courts because people won't listen and submit to what the Bible says. It's sad. But Paul uses strong language. How dare you do this? And to them, it was the common practice. It, it wasn't like the exception to the rule, like a custody battle over a baby or something like that. And it wasn't that. It was, a, it was the common practice that, oh, you know what? You owe me $1,500? let us go to court. Let's just sue one another. Everybody's sue happy. Trying to take advantage of other people. It, it's unbelievable. It still happens in today's day and age. Do you know, listen, do you know churches and Christians? Listen, people are afraid to hire people within their own church or within their own movement. I can't, I got to get, because these people, I, I kind of worship with them, I kind of know them, they'll take advantage of me and this and that. Isn't that sad? Is it supposed to be like that? And then you'll, I'll, I'll have people tell me, well, that's wise, that's just using wisdom. No, but it's not the way God wants it. Especially people that know each other, that worship together, that love the Lord. You should be able to trust one another at least a little bit. Seriously. But they have to go outside the church to take care of these matters. Listen, it's funny when, especially when it's money, when money's involved, isn't it? But Paul says, why not suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Meaning, it's before you go over there, lose the money. 
I, I don't tell me that, Pastor Man. You don't know what kind of financial state I'm in. I, I don't know, but I don't know, but God does. That's what Paul tells them, and that's what they were doing. And he uses the analogy here. Do you not know that the saint shall judge the world? Now listen, as he talks to them, he uses the same terminology. Verse 2, do you not know? And he'll use it over and over again. Verse 3, don't you know or know you not? Verse 15, know you not? Verse 16, know you not? Verse 19, know you not? He's teaching them. He goes, this should be common sense in the church. And he says, know you not or don't you know? As if they've been taught this before. Remember, Paul founded this church. As if it's common sense, if you're a believer and there's another believer, you should be able to work it out amongst godly believers and not go out to somebody who has no clue about the living God and is not worshiping the living God. He goes, don't you know, don't you know, don't you know? I ask you, don't you know? And I'll ask me, don't I know? Don't you know that the saints shall judge the world? Meaning, in this area of judging, you're going to let an unjust court, unbelievers judge you. Don't you know if you're in Christ, you're a saint, that you're going to judge the world one day? He goes, don't you know that? Now watch what he says. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge in even the smallest of matters? See, if you're going to stand in judgment, you're going to rule and reign with Christ, and you're going to judge the world one day, how that's going to break down, I can only speculate. And he's going to get into it a little bit here. If God's going to use you to judge the world, isn't there a couple godly believers, even the lowest esteemed in the church, that can judge on even the smallest matters? He's correcting them. Watch what he says. Know you not, verse 3, know you not that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? He goes, don't you know we're going to judge spiritual beings one day? Now, how does that break down? I wish Paul gave us a little more here. But he doesn't. Now, I don't think we're going to judge the godly angels that are around us, that protect us, that kind of watch over us for the Lord. We're not going to stand there and say, hey, uh, you know, Gabe, I, I, I wish you did a little bit better job in this area. You know? <laughs> Seriously, smarten up. You know, if, you, if I was the angel, I would have did this, this, and that. I don't think that's going to be what you're doing. I think the judging of angels is, I think it's the fallen angels. I think the fallen angels that have tempted you that have been around since the beginning of time that know you and know your thought process that kind of orchestrate things and put things in your past in your path you're going to sit before them one day and you're going to be able to judge them for what they've done to you your family and everything else it's very interesting that's like listen and if if you read um ezekiel it talks about when satan is judged one day and you know what we say we say is this the man that shook the nations as he's judged, and we judge him with God. It's interesting. He goes, don't you know if, that we're going to judge angels one day? If we judge these fallen angels, how much more can we not make decisions without going to unjust courts to make decisions for us? If then, verse 4, if then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, let them... Set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He goes, just take, the, take anybody. If the leadership's not doing their job, take anybody that's not esteemed in the church. They don't have any position. They just love the Lord. And let them listen to it. He goes, if the leadership's not going to do its job, if you guys aren't doing its job, take those who are least esteemed in the church, bring them out, let them hear the issue, let them make a decision. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brothers, but brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? He says, take it. Be a doormat. We don't like that. But that's what he says. 
let yourself be taken advantage of. That's what he says. You say, well, Pastor Matt, I've died. I got to stand up for myself. And listen, I don't get these, these Christians who run out of churches and they walk around saying, Christ told us to stand up for ourselves. Jesus said, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be called the children of God, for God makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, meaning that God even blesses the unjust. But you need to pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, what about believers? What about believers? He says, why not suffer yourself to be defrauded? Why not take the wrong? Now, listen. If you read Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9, we don't have time to turn there. But it basically talks about sticking up for those who can't stick up for themselves. There's a balance here. What if there's a child involved? What if there's a baby involved? What if, and, and what if that person's not coming before the church? What if they just won't listen to anybody in the church? What if they're bent on having their own way and their own will? What do you do? Well, listen, let me tell you this. When it's money, you lose it. That's what he says. Defraud it, taking advantage of If it has to do with the child or a person, that's the, a, 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 a woman, anybody that's going through something, a widow, if people won't listen in the church, that person should be disfellowshipped. And then what should happen is, if you have to go to the court route, then you have to. But that should be last case scenario. Every attempt should be made to bring people to the church with godly people who can make decisions and help them through things. That's what the Bible says. That's what it says. That should be the exception not the rule. We could have sued all those people. We could have sued that guy that took advantage of the church. We could have did all that. But my God's bigger than $9,000. Your God's bigger than $9,000. Your God's bigger than the, than the Christian electrician or carpenter or whoever else who took advantage of you. Even the Christian lawyer who might have taken advantage of you. Your God is bigger than that. That's what Paul says. Verse 8, nay, you do wrong and defraud, and, and that your brethren, your brothers, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen, he's going to say, in the context here, is brother going to war against brother in the church before unjust courts? He goes, you're doing the wrong thing. You're not even trying to do the right thing. Now look what he says. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He's like, you're going before the unrighteous courts. Don't you know that they're, gonna not, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God? And then what he's going to tell them, listen to me. What he's going to tell them is, you're acting like them. You're acting like them. That's what he tells them. Watch. Know you not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom or shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Now listen, he lays down a list here. Neither fornicators. Now listen, fornicators, what's that? Sexual, sex outside of marriage. Not just adultery, any sex. And it's not talking about, oh, I had a fall or I stumbled, I this, I that. It's talking about if fornicators, that's your lifestyle. You need to check your life. You check your salvation if this is your lifestyle. This is what he says. Now watch. Now, now don't run out of here saying, Pastor Matt said I can fornicate once or twice as long as it's not my lifestyle. <laughs> you can't do that. Don't do that. I love it when people call to me and say, Pastor Matt, you know what? Is it all right for me to, you know, to, to beat this person up? Because God's going to forgive me anyway. Pastor Matt, is it all right for me to go get wasted because I know God's going to forgive me anyway? Pastor Matt, you know what? I kind of have a thing for this girl. Is it all right for me to do this because Jesus forgives me? God's... Well, a Christian shouldn't be thinking like that anyway. Your heart's already in the wrong place. Your heart's going the wrong way. And that's why when people come in and they say, I can live the way I want, I can do whatever I want, and, and, and there's blatant sin in their lives, we pull them aside and we say, well, you, you can't live this way. 
Now, much of the time, it's people working through things. They're trying to battle it out. They're trying to make decisions. They got to count the cost to do this and not do that. You know, they're at least trying to get it right. But once in a while, we get people that come in and say, I can do this and I'm going to do that. And this is what I'm going to do. And then I, then I take them here and I said, don't you know that people who live these things and practice these things won't inherit the kingdom of God? Don't judge me. Don't judge my salvation. I'm not. Just read the Bible. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters. Those who worship idols. The Bible says, by the way, that covetousness is idolatry. Nor adulterers. Sex while you're married with somebody else. Nor effeminate. Now that's a specific word in the Greek. What it means is, in a homosexual relationship, the one who takes kind of the female role. That's what effeminate is. Nor abuses of themselves with mankind. In a homosexual relationship, someone who takes like the male dominant role. That's what that is. And that's why it's, it's just sad to me. I told you as we were, me and the other pastors were praying about a month ago, you know, what should we do as if the church, the church is growing, people can't park and this and that. Do we, you know, maybe we can use another church so we can sell this building, use the money for the, toward the other building. All these things we're trying to go through. And I told you this, I don't know if I told you this a while back, but I, I went on the other churches in Danvers. And right in their state, their, their like, you know, mission statement, we expect people from, from, from all lifestyles. Homosexual, and every other one you could possibly name. For we believe that's the spirit of Christ. And I said, okay. Now, listen, let me tell you what they're not saying. What they're not saying is people that are from all these walks of life can get saved and come out of those things. What they're saying is it's okay to practice those things. But the Bible just said it's not okay to practice those things. Well, that's in the Old Testament. That was in Leviticus. Well, it's all through your Bible. Now, I know the whole hate the sin, you know, love the sinner. I get all that. But don't you know that all those churches, I, I looked at almost all of them, besides maybe two, that's what they had in this statement. Sad. The Bible talks about in the, in, in the last days there'll be apostasy falling away from the faith. People that are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I think we're in those days. Honestly, I really do. It's scary to me. I hope we hold fast to the truth. He says, nor abuses of themselves with mankind. Listen, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. He says that's how the unbelievers act. That's what they do. And you're bringing your issues in the church before them, and you guys are acting just like them in the church. And Paul checks them here. Listen, it's not only here. Galatians 5.19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. You know what witchcraft is? It's pharmakia. It's continual drug use. Habitual drug use. That's what it is. Don't just take my word for it. Go home and study. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such, such the like of the which I told you this before, church at Galatia, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So what are we learning from our Bibles today? That if this is our lifestyle, then we need to check our salvation. Because listen, when the Bible says you're saved, when you receive Jesus Christ, new life comes into you. It's new life. You're born again from above. The Spirit of God indwells you. That's why Paul tells the Roman ch church, what does he tell them? He, he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue therein? He basically says you cannot continue in your sin. 
So let's just try to get people to come to church and, you know, we'll change the doctrinal state and we'll say, God accepts and allows all these things. That's how we made you. Absolutely not. It's scary to me. I'll read you something else. Ephesians 5. For this you know, verse 5. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. What they're doing in all these, with all these teachings is deceiving people with vain words. Scary. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not you therefore partakers with them. All right. I don't know if you've been turning, but back to 1 Corinthians. Paul made the point here. He made it in Ephesians. He made it in Galatians. He makes it in all the epistles, by the way. That when you're in Christ, you should be a new creation. There should be a difference. Now listen, he's not talking about battling and struggling and having a fall and getting back up. He's not talking about that. Sometimes people come and say, Pastor Matt, I did this. I sinned in this way. I've been doing this. Uh, I'm afraid that I lose my salvation. And I'll, I'll comfort that person. I'll say, the fact is that you care about these things shows that there's new life in you. Now stop doing those things. Stop doing that. And then that's where the hard part comes. And then they say, well, I can't. It's hard. It's difficult. And I said, wait, well, wait a minute. So you're telling me some Christians can have victory and some can't? So God loves those other Christians more or he's given them more grace than he's given to you? Well, no, it's different. We have, you know, we have a different upbringing, a different past, a different background. Well, the Bible says there's no temptation given with that such is common to man. Common to man. That means we all go through things. We're all tempted. We're all tried. We all battle in different ways. And the bottom line is there's an abundant fountain of grace, but it's your choice whether you're going to step into the fountain or you're just going to get the drips that come off the outside. Because God's no respecter of persons. He loves us all the same. Jesus died for every one of us. You can have victory. And that's what Paul is. Now listen, this sounds kind of doom and gloom here, but it's really not if you read the context. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you. You see what he says? Such were some of you. Some there were effeminate. Were. But now they're a saint in Jesus Christ. Some were abusers of themselves with mankind. They were, but now they, are, they have new life in Jesus Christ. Drunkards, idolaters, all of those things, covetousness. You were that, but now you're not that anymore. Such were some of you, and such were some of you and me. Now the choice for us, are we going to let the dead man reign, or are we going to let the living Christ reign in us? Are we going to get the living Christ sit on the throne? Are we going to get the, let the living Christ give us victory? And listen, I say this to people all the time because we all struggle with sin. We all battle with sin. But every single one of them, they say, I can't have victory. Oh, the church ain't helping me. You're not helping me, Pastor Matt. I can't help anybody. All I can do is say what this says. I'm just being honest with you. I, uh, that's all we can do. Well, this, this is raw. Don't you know God works through other ways and other things and other... I, no. Because he don't. Jesus Christ died for the church. He empowers the church. He works through the church. He's given us his word. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. God breathed it and it's profitable for doctrine. That's what you learn. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly or thoroughly furnished for all good works. You know what that says? That the word of God, if you apply it, if you obey it, can do everything you need. That's what it says. 
And like I say this all the time, if it can't, then I'll burn every one of my Bibles because I don't believe it. But it can. Just like Paul said to the church at Corinth in chapter 15, they're all walking around saying, well, Christ really, he really didn't rise from the dead. You know, it was like a spiritual resurrection. You know, that really didn't happen. And it doesn't matter if you believe in the resurrection anyway. It's just the change that happens in, you know, in the spirit of resurrection. You know what Paul says? Paul's, you know, he's very simple. He's profound, but he's simple. He goes, well, wait a minute. If you believe that, why are you going to church on Sunday? He said, if you believe that, that Christ didn't really rise from the dead, then where are your family members going? They're, they're burning in hell right now. He's, he breaks it down, and he goes, but at the end of that, he goes, but Christ is risen from the dead. And then he says, you know what? If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we're of all men most miserable, most to be pitied. People should be feeling bad for us, but they hate us. You know why they hate us? They hate anybody who's living full on for Jesus Christ. And I want to say this, Christians even hate Christians that are living full on for Jesus Christ, which is sad. But you know why they hate us? Because Christ is risen from the dead. Do you know why Christians get mad at me and at churches that take a hardline stance that this is the word of God and it is prof profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? Now listen, it says, so the man of God might be thoroughly, that's everything, you're fully furnished to do the work of God that God has called you to do. That means everything. That means it can do everything. So you can sit there and tell God it can't. And I can sit there and tell God it can't, but God sits there and tells me that it can't. And that's why Paul says, such were some of you. But now you're washed. You're clean. Look what he says. Such were some of you, but you are washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Listen, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and belly for meats, but God shall destroy both both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. You see what he says here? Listen, this is a study for next week. But he's saying God made you to fill you, that you might be an instrument, a vessel that he can use to love through you. That's what it says. And that, you know, the church was battling through these things, meat sacrifice to idols and all this, and Paul's going to get into that. You know what he's saying? Meats for the belly, belly for meats. I like a lot of meat for the belly. Amen. Really. And it shows too. Now listen. He said, God, he goes, God's going to destroy both all those things. He goes, but your body ultimately is made for the Lord. Guys, the Lord has made your body, men, to fill you that you might love him first. And if you're married, love your wife right after that. And then love your kids and love other people. That's what God wants to do through you. Ladies, God has made your body that he might fill you, that he might empower you, that you might love him first. And if you're married, to love your husband right after that, your kids and those around you. That's why God made you. You're made for the Lord. He says, such were some of you. But now you're washed, you're clean, you're sanctified, you're justified. You know what that means, justified? Very simple. I heard one pastor say, just as if I never sinned. You're justified. You're pure in God's sight. Now the command is to go and live it. And listen, I know when people battle through this, and this is where I started, I went off on this rant, so forgive me. I challenge people. They say, I, I've been trying, it doesn't work. And I've been, I've been coming to church. And I said, yeah, coming to church is part of it. Getting with the saints is part of it. But God didn't just save you to get you to be part of a church. And, you know, he, that's part of it. But he loves you personally, too. Are you spending any time with him? And I said, I challenge you to do this. I challenge you. That sin that you're battling them with, you, I, you get on your face one hour a day for a year before God. And then you come back to me after a year that you were on your face, pouring out your heart before God. And as the Holy Spirit revealed things to you, you made changes and you stopped doing certain things. You get on your face before God and obey the word of God. And then tell me in a year if God can't, doesn't deliver you. Not one person's come back to me and say, hey, Pastor Matt, I did it for a year. <laughs> nope. Because by the way, God usually does it quicker than that if you have that kind of heart. 
But then we have people battling for four, five, six, ten years, and they've never done what the Bible says. Get on your face. You're in a fight. You're in a battle. you got to fight the fight of faith on your face. It's spiritual warfare. Pastor Matt, I hate these people when I come to church. Get on your face for a year before God. Beg God to see them the way he sees them. Pastor Matt, I can't stand my wife. You know what the Bible says? If you can't stand your wife, you really can't stand yourself. Because she's a reflection of you. You know, the wife's going to go home and I say, hey, <laughs> it's your fault. Get on your face before God for a year, for an hour. Beg God to show you things and let you see things the way he sees things. Beg God to help you obey the simple revealed truth of the word of God and watch what God will do in your life. Such were some of you. Now you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. And I guess this is how I tie it into communion. How are we washed? How are we sanctified? That means holy, set apart for the, past, the, the, the master's use. How? Because Jesus died for you, that's how. Because Jesus shed his blood for you. Shed his blood for every one of us. He loves us enough to save us, and he loves us enough to deliver us from all of our sin. Listen, hear me. Christ's blood is powerful enough, powerful enough, enough to give us eternal life, and it's powerful enough practically to deliver from sin. It makes me crazy when churches compromise and they say, I believe in Jesus' blood. It's powerful enough to give me eternal life, but it's not strong enough to get me through the things in this life. That's garbage. It's not what it says. It's not true. It's heresy. Jesus died for you. He delivered you.